A nation can survive its fools, and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. <laughs> about the wars, they've been wrong about jobs, they've been wrong about everything. The question is, are they stupid or do they have a plan? I actually think for the most part, they have a plan, but some are not too smart. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show, the anti-globalist America First program dedicated to de-hoaxing the media and destroying the narrative. Here's your host, the founder and editor of The Daily Stir, Matt Wingard. Welcome to The Horrible Deplorable Show. I'm Matt Wingard, The Horrible Deplorable, and with me as always is my friend Doris. Hello, Doris. Hello, Matt. This is a podcast we originally started doing for the Gab community, although I know there are people outside of Gab who are listening now. You can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, and the 405media.com, which we play at 5 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. So I hope you'll give us a listen. Okay, so the big news this week was Hurricane Harvey. And rather than go through the details of that, which you can get from the news and all that, I thought I'd give you my take on sort of what I saw as it all unfolded. And, and based on what we talk about in this show, I think you know where I'm going to go on this. It was interesting to see how the mainstream media and the networks and all the rest have gotten to a point now where it used to be that they had a, a you know a left bias and that during normal times they would be perpetrating that on an ongoing basis and then when there was a fire or a catastrophe or a hurricane or an earthquake or something really significant all of that pretense would get dropped and they would just do their job as journalists for the next day or two covering the events as they happen. So you could get this respite from their constant liberalism basically during some kind of major event. But we have progressed to the point now where we can't even escape it during a disaster. They bring their politics with them into the coverage of even a significant disaster like Hurricane Harvey. I saw it all over the place. Any decision that the president made was immediately criticized. Was he prepared? Was he prepared enough? Did he say enough soothing things? Were his tweets insensitive? Was his wife wearing the wrong shoes? Did he go to the Texas too quickly or not soon enough? Is he going to have to give up his tax cuts now to get money for Hurricane Harvey? I mean, just everything always through a lens of how can we... Oh, and then there was, you know, the storm was made worse by global warming, even though really it's about the fact that Houston's the fourth largest metropolis in the United States. So more and more people are living in the path of hurricanes, and that's why these hurricanes are doing so much damage. It doesn't matter, apparently, that we had no significant hurricanes for a decade. There was, uh, let's see, there was a, one of the, I mean, it's become a joke. Minorities hit hardest or women hit hardest headlines. I mean, people actually make fun of that on the internet, but uh, someone had a totally tin ear and went ahead and did a legitimate headline about how minorities were being hit hardest by Hurricane Harvey. Of course, that's assuming that minorities are poor. All minorities are poor. Political put out a cartoon that would basically made fun of Harvey victims as Republicans or Trump voters, you know, that they are suddenly clamoring for federal help, you know, as a helicopter is coming to get them from the Coast Guard, even though they don't like government. And they deleted that within minutes. But of course, everything lasts forever on the Internet. And that was saved and shared around. I see that Charlie Hebdo this morning, the folks who got almost completely wiped out by Muslim terrorists in France, put out a cover that basically shows Harvey victims. It's basically the water level. People have drowned and all you can see are the top of their flagpoles with the Nazi flags. And the idea apparently is that the people in Houston were Trump supporters, so they were Nazis and they're the ones that are drowning. I mean, pretty stupid. But that is just, I think, reflexive. It's clear now, I mean, if in a major disaster like Harvey, they cannot help but bring their politics to to literally everything that they're covering. Then There's no shared national interest. I mean, I think you could make the argument when this stuff was dropped during a national crisis that there was still some vein of Americanism that everybody shared that reflexively would rise to the top, and it's not there now. Now, I realize that lots of people, Democrats and Republicans in Texas, just got to work helping folks and rescuing folks, and I saw a lot of people 
trying to make the argument or making the argument that that's the real America, that, that there isn't this division between us, that people get right to doing it. But our overlords are not on the same boat. I realize that rank and file American citizens can work this stuff out, but our overlords matter. They have a tremendous effect on the dialogue, on the narrative, on the tone, and they are absolutely intent on having their way. And they're a poison. They're a poison in the body politic, and they're a poison with a tremendous amount of power. It's Power dynamics are, they just, they matter. And the fact that the most powerful people in our country don't have any feeling of camaraderie with us, cannot drop their politics during a crisis to just focus on the needs at hand. That's very, very telling. But I wonder how many humanitarians out there are really fed up with the press acting this way on something of this order. I think there's a tremendous amount of disgust. But we're going to learn a lot next year during the election cycle because... I saw that the Fox did a poll showing that a majority of people think that the president is tearing the country apart. Well, that's not, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure I believe that poll. I would knock 10 points off just for the fact that these polls are always skewed, which would still put it at around 45%. But that makes perfect sense when you, I mean, if you turn on the network news, which obviously I don't, and I encourage most of you not to, but, you know, we all know that millions of people are still watching those stations and they're being absolutely inundated with Trump is Hitler stuff on a daily basis. How could those sheeple not conclude that the country's coming apart, that the president's going in the wrong direction? It's all deliberate. Most of us have learned to either check out from the narrative or we've self-educated enough that we understand the snake oil salesmen that are coming at us and we can interpret it. But a lot of people are just sitting there soaking that in like a sponge. The sheeple, as we've talked about. And it, that's why it's important to understand what the narrative is and what the narrative is, is that's being sold. Because even if you're immune to it, millions of other Americans are not. And you need to know what current hoax the mob is running around with pitchforks and torches getting all angry about. And so the poll result like that really doesn't surprise me at all. What's going to be interesting to me is how much pushback, organized pushback, is there next year. We've talked about the three Senate Republicans that need to be taken out in their primaries. A whole host of House members need to be challenged. We have appropriations subcommittee chairs who have completely laughed off the president's budget cuts. There isn't going to be anything in the way of budget cuts, and and a whole bunch of people need to be targeted. We're going to get that go through that here specifically. But I did want to wrap up the Harvey comments by saying that I think Texas is a shining example of the America that always was and can still be people helping people. There's a tremendous amount of damage. Five, at least 500,000 people have had their home damaged in one way or another. It's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 100 to $200 billion in, in, in damage that is done or in aid that needs to be given. And it's going to take those folks some time to recover. But absolutely, you see the best of humanity out there. It's like a candle in the dark giving you just some sense of what we can be if we can beat back these elites and demote them, which is what needs to happen, that a lot of these people just need to lose their power. But I, you know if you follow me on my podcast that I don't believe in going after the Democrats and the media. First of all, we don't have that kind of leverage to get after them as conservatives, but I don't think we need to. I'm convinced that the problem is within our own party and that if we got our own house in order, I've said it before that when Republicans are united, they never lose. If we can get our own house in order, if we can f flush out the rhinos and eject them from the party and get a Republican party that stands for the things that Trump's been talking about and backs him up, we'll move mountains, folks. We will move mountains. So out in San Francisco, the Patriot Prayer folks, who had been beaten back in Portland, attempted to hold a rally in San Francisco, Antifa, you know, Romney's angels, had made it clear that they would be there to violently confront them. The Patriot Rally folks decided to cancel that. I tweeted at the time and gabbed that I think San Francisco and a number of places in the United States are now free speech, no-go zones. And some people decided to show, they went ahead and had their antifa rally it's supposed to be a rally against hate in which a few thousand of these hippie types show up but antifa always mixes in and those folks 
because they're worthless pacifists, can't really do anything about that anyway. They're not the solution, trust me on that. Any fog comes flooding in and begins kind of indiscriminately attacking folks. Anybody with a Republican shirt or hat got attacked, uh, just reporters trying to cover them got attacked. And it's amazing that you got uh, Nancy Pelosi condemned that and a few people started to condemn that. Pay attention, Mitt Romney. But I, I just think it's amazing that they can go around. Nothing that happened in that park hasn't been happening for a year and a half. And the willful ignorance, the blindness that's been going on. Then Charlottesville occurs, and because there's some white nationalists and a handful of neo-Nazi types and a handful of KKK types, everybody's ready to just suddenly lift Antifa up as this group of angels protecting Americans. Anyone who'd actually followed them and their violent activity for a year and a half knew that was laughable, including the President of the United States when he plainly said there were there was violence on both sides. And now we're two weeks later, and you have a whole bunch of people admitting that there's violence on both sides. Now, I can, I'm can i old enough to remember when that made you a Nazi. That was two weeks ago, by the way. That made you a Nazi because the President of the United States said there was violence on both sides. So just, again, it all just plays out in real time now. The kinds of things that used to take a decade to unravel, the kinds of media lies and hoaxes that would take years to unravel, they now unravel in a matter of weeks, sometimes hours. Two weeks ago, the president was a Nazi sympathizer for saying that there was violence on both sides. And now, here we are, 14 days after that narrative was pushed on us, and Nancy Pelosi saying there's violence on both sides. They have no conscience. I've made this argument before about the 180-degree tactics. They'll say one thing on Monday and turn around and say the exact opposite thing on Tuesday, whatever serves their interests. And these are basically socialist, communist, left interests. They're going to push lies all the time. And there are a lot of people out there just drinking this poison on a daily basis from these folks. You know, when you're going to travel, you often look and see about health warnings makes me wonder what's happening in San Francisco. I'm not sure I'd want to go there when the police even back down from these thugs. Between the homelessness, the urination that goes on everywhere, and then Antifa roam in the streets, I happen to have some affection for San Francisco. had a relative that lived there for a while. I spent a bit of time in San Francisco. But there's nothing in San Francisco that's so wonderful that I wouldn't recommend abandoning the city at this point. There may be a time in the future when it'd be possible to return to San Francisco, but there there's nothing about San Francisco, whether it's the view or the restaurants or just the vibe at times, none of that is worth what San Francisco has become. And I would not recommend that any tourists go anywhere near San Francisco. There are plenty of other places to go in the United States and in the world to have a good time and to enjoy beautiful views and food and all the rest. There's nothing that San Francisco has that's just irreplaceable. I did want to address some of what I'm going to call the lame defeatism that's coming from so-called Trump supporters. As Bannon has left and Gorka has left, there have, there have been some prominent figures on the Trump side who've been kind of whining and complaining and gnashing of teeth, claiming that Trump has gone soft or that the globalists have taken over. I think it's important to understand that a lot of this is self-interested. So a number of these people had in Bannon or in Gorka in, or in others, they had very significant sources within the Trump White House. And with these people out, they no longer have access to that information for their own blogs and for their own tweets. They prided themselves on scooping and being the first one to tell us something, and they don't have that access now. So this gnashing of teeth and pulling of hair and all of that is really about their loss of power and influence, and that they're taking it out on Trump. I think that anybody who's been with Trump from the beginning should not be jumping the ship at this point. I'm going to address Ann Coulter in a second, but I want to make the point that the only indispensable person in the White House is Trump. He can surround himself with people we think are globalists all day long. He has proven time and again that he's going to push for his way. Anybody who thinks that somehow he's being neutered there needs to a really quick reminder about the fact that he went against all those folks to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord. He just went against all those folks to issue the trans gender 
memo. And Doris and I were talking about this yesterday. To be clear on what that was, people are trying to people in the press are trying to claim that Mad Dog Mattis has somehow reversed his decision. That's not what's happened. The president has restored the policy that was in effect for most of Obama's administration. At the very end, they made a decision that they were going to allow the military to recruit or take in transgenders and to perform surgeries, medical surgeries for transgenders. And they even delayed the implementation of that policy until January 1st of 2018. So it didn't actually take place during the Obama administration, but they had set in motion a process where it was going to. All that happened was that Mattis came in and froze that, and then Trump basically reversed it and said, we're not at a future date going to implement that new policy. We're going to maintain the one that we have now. So there was really no rollback of anything that had actually taken place. And in his order, Trump made it clear that he wanted the Defense Department to study this further. So the fact that Mattis has said he's going to study this is simply an implementation of what the president's order had actually asked him to do. So the pre, you know, the press is out there hoaxing again, trying to claim that somehow Mattis has stood up to the president and said, no, that is not what happened at all. His memo is being fully implemented. And we'll just have to see how that all works out. I think that when you're dealing with a group that has significant mental health issues, and I'm not p picking on transgenders specifically, there are a lot of groups who can be statistically identified as having higher than normal mental health issues, the military doesn't want to take those folks in. And they shouldn't have to. That's not their job to be some kind of social experiment. As is famously said, their job is to kill people and break things, and they need to be very efficient at that. And there are lots of people that don't make the cut in the military for all sorts of medical reasons. If you have asthma, you'll have trouble getting into the military. They are only going to take the most physically fit people that they can. And when you're dealing with a group that has the mental health issues that many transgender folks have, the idea of wholesale recruiting those folks is just, just the opposite of the military's mission. Now, everybody on the left is going to make this about discriminating against people based on their sexual orientation, but I think that's obviously Barbara Streisand. It's BS. The military looks at these things very methodically, and they have very good reasons. If they do, they have very good reasons to conclude that this is a group they don't want to recruit from. What I object to is paying for these sex change operations. I mean, the taxpayers are paying for that. And uh, what is it going to be next, that women in the military, that we can pay for having their breasts augmented? Well, the Navy deals with a problem of women on the ships who have to be airlifted out because they're pregnant. They have, you know, Once a woman becomes pregnant on a ship, she's relieved of duty or she's taken to back to the mainland. And there's a percentage, I think it's something around 20% of all the women on these ships who get assigned end up being taken off for pregnancy. So there's obviously intercourse that's happening on the ships. And I don't think that that helps the Navy to be sharp and to be focused on their mission. And we're seeing, we've seen a bunch of collisions out in the Pacific now. I have no idea whether that's connected to the policy of having women on the ships, but I think it's clear that over time the Navy, the military has been forced to take on a lot of social objectives from the left rather than remaining narrowly focused on just being a lethal, efficient killing machine ready to go if called by the commander-in-chief. And that has to have some kind of an effect over time on their readiness. So whether they're directly connected or not, I think the general direction that the military is forced to go in by all of these leftist mandates is not good for them. And I don't believe for a second that the politicians who push these policies actually care about the people that they claim to be defending. I think these are tools to erode the military, which is an organization they do not like. And these are just hammers they pick up on the side of the road along the way, the political road, that they can use to bludgeon the military down. So back to my point about this defeatism that has infected some folks. I think there's a lot of self-interest there. I would ignore a lot of it. The president does what he wants to do. I, there was this article recently where someone leaked a conversation 
a private conversation in the Oval Office where the president was said, just flat out saying, I want tariffs, bring me tariffs. And I know that he's pointing to some of the people in the room, and I know some of you don't want them, but I want you to bring me tariffs. So he, he's his own man. I think anybody who's been following him from the beginning could not doubt that fact that he is his own man. We need to judge him on what the executive is empowered to do and what he does manage to get accomplished, and we will reassess his report card at the end of the year. But I already see people sort of transferring blame to him for things that the, the Republican Congress is not doing. And that's just Barbara Streisand again. We need to be holding these folks accountable for not being on the Trump drain, folks that were elected. I no longer believe that this is that the GOP is going to accomplish much of anything this year. I think that they will likely do the tax cuts. I'll talk about that in a second. Some version of the tax cuts, but this is something the US Chamber wants and we've talked about this before. We, you know, the conservative parts of Trump agenda, they move along, the nationalist parts get stalled by the GOP. The US Chamber of Commerce wants the tax cuts, so I've noticed that that gets a lot more friendly hearing in all of the right places. But I, there isn't going to be an Obamacare repeal. There, I doubt there's going to be wall funding. There will be no significant budget cuts. And you can now see and will see throughout the rest of this year who the GOP really are. It's on us to send a strong message to them by defeating those three key senators. I'm talking about Jeff Lake in Arizona, Dean Heller in Nevada, and Bob Corker in Tennessee. We must defeat all three of those and many House members, and we'll identify those targets in a future podcast. This was never going to be easy or short, so buckle up. We've got our work to do. On the tax cuts, Ann Coulter's very upset. She called his speech tone deaf, and she wants him concentrating on the wall and these other things, and she doesn't think the tax cuts are significant. I'm going to go back to what I said in a very early podcast and repeat myself because it's all going exactly as I predicted. Anyone who understands Trump's objectives should not be surprised by the push for the tax cuts. We always knew he was going to push those. We always knew these were important to him. He is very focused on trying to get above 4% growth. And getting these tax cuts, which is getting the corporate rate down, repatriating the money back, simplifying the, the corporate money back, simplifying the tax code, these are the things that he believes, I think correctly, will aid in jump-starting and pushing the economy. He's doing a lot to roll back regulations and to get a lot of agency decisions that push forward on, on oil drilling and natural resource extraction and all the rest, but he needs the tax cuts as well. So that's all part of his plan for economic growth, including the trade deal renegotiations. So nobody should be surprised that he's pushing those. But what I argued months ago was that they cannot happen by themselves, that he needs the wall and the Obamacare repeal and the, the trade deal renegotiations and the infrastructure bill to as part of a larger package so that the tax cuts don't sit there by themselves because the tax cuts basically are for the rich. They have an important role to play in pushing this economy. But when you mix them in with all of the other parts of his national agenda, it's perfectly fine. It's part of an overall agenda. But when the GOP comes along and strips out everything else, they can't do the infrastructure bill, they can't fund the wall, won't fund the wall, they won't repeal Obamacare, right? The only reason regulations are being stripped back is because, Obama, because uh, President Trump can do that himself through the agencies. The Congress is not assisting him in any single way except for what the chamber wants, which are the tax cuts. So just as I said months ago, we're headed towards a scenario where by the end of the year, the only accomplishment that will have occurred is the tax cuts. And while I don't fully agree with what Ann Coulter is saying, the sentiment is correct. She's angry, essentially, because it looks like that's the only thing that's going to get accomplished. And in that light, it will look very bad for the president. It can't be at the end of the year that the only thing he has to show from this great list of Make America Great promises, the only thing is the tax cuts. By themselves, they look quite ugly because they look like the only thing the Republicans could deliver for were for elites and the rich. 
and all of them have to be punished next year. They must be punished. So as part of an overall strategy for jumpstarting the economy, which is rolling back regulations, building the wall, reducing immigration, redoing the trade agreements, and then the tax cuts, that's a great agenda for getting that economic growth above 4%. But strip everything else away and just have the tax cuts and you see who the Republicans are, folks. And even though uh, presumably both sides want infrastructure funding, how is that going to be affected by the billions that are going to have to be paid out for Houston? Well, half of what we do is deficit spending anyway. This goes to my point about the budget cuts. The president had asked for billions of dollars in budget cuts. If we had a Republican Congress that weren't a bunch of liars who campaign on cutting the budget but now have the opportunity to do it and won't, there would be room in there for Harvey funding and for infrastructure. Most of the infrastructure package is being designed to not need a lot of federal government money. They're trying to do a trillion dollars with like 200 billion of that in actual federal funds coming from the gas tax and other things and the rest coming from essentially goosing corporations to do it in exchange for tolling fees, ownership of some of the infrastructure, what have you. They haven't really revealed the specifics of that infrastructure package, but it isn't designed to, to need a trillion dollars in government funding. I think that we have to prepare ourselves for a very ugly reality at the end of the year. If the only thing, the con first of all, there's, it looks like only one of two scenarios is going to play out, and they're both very ugly. One is they do absolutely nothing by the end of the year. And the other scenario is that they manage to pass only the tax cuts by the end of the year. Both insanely stupid and ugly results. But either one, either one, is a complete and total indictment of the Republican Party as a group of frauds, as professional Washington generals, players who throw the game to the Globetrotters on a daily basis because they're paid to. And we will have to take heads next year. I wanted to do a quick Russia hoax update. So Dana Rohrbacher is a California congressman who's actually gone out to the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK and sat down with Julian Assange and had a conversation with him. He's not giving specifics on that because he's expecting some releases from WikiLeaks in the near future. But he was on Hannity last night. And, ha and startled Hannity in this conversation, which I'm going to recount because I thought it was so interesting. Hannity, who I think believes the Russia story, the Russia collusion story is a hoax, but it do I don't think he can bring himself to believe that everyone is lying about this. So he says to Dana, what's your percentage of confidence that this entire Russia collusion story is a lie? And my sense is that Hannity expected Dana to say 90% or 85% or something like that. And Dana said... Based on my conversations with Julian Assange and what I know, 99%. And there was just this stunned look on Hannity's face. He says, so for the last year, the media and the Democrats have just been completely lying about this? And I'm just chuckling, thinking, well, welcome to the party. I've been telling you folks that this thing is a total and complete lie from the beginning. I have enough background in journalism, and I have been watching these people for years that I can tell when they're lying, when they're desperately pushing a lie, when they're lying to themselves. when you, I can just tell by the forced stories. I read some of these stories and I can just see the conversation between the editor and the reporter that prompted the story and how forced the language is. So many of these stories are so mealy mouth. If you read them and you're looking for them to actually state a fact and you get down to like the ninth paragraph and they have yet to actually state something that's a known fact. It's all just innuendo and an unnamed source claims this. I have enough history with this that these are nothing burgers. You read these stories and you're like, you have not actually landed a punch here. You've made a lot of accusations and a sheeple will read that and think, oh, the president's in collusion with Russia. But there were no actual facts in the story. And I could spot this a mile away that this thing was a fraud, and I have no doubt that that's how it's going to turn out. But I did want to make a point when you're looking at this lie unfold. A lot of people are making the mistake of thinking, well, the media has gotten really bad in the last five or ten years. So much of what they do now is lying. I realize that this is part of the red pill process, but I need to push you along a little ways. If you think that the media has gotten worse in the last 
10 years, 15 years, you need to check yourself and, and reevaluate your premises. What's happened is that social media and the growth of right side media, right leaning media, and the ability to fact check this and to respond in real time, that's what's grown up in the last decade and a half. The ability to identify the hoaxing, to prove the lie quickly and efficiently, that is what has happened in, in the last decade. So it's the next step in your political evolution is to understand that if they are this big of liars, and then now they're being found out very quickly, they always were. And for a long time, there was no ability to fact check them and to prove the lie. And so things that were hoaxed and were put out there, the seamen hardened. And they rolled down the conveyor belt, you know, behind the present. If you think about a conveyor belt going back into history, you know, the conveyor belt moves on. We're all in the present. But if you look back along that conveyor belt, all of that stuff that were their lies and their narrative pushes, they become the accepted history. And I invite you all to begin to look back at what you thought happened in the 90s and what you thought happened in the 80s and what you thought happened in the 70s and ask yourself if it was all... CNNs and MSNBC types that were delivering me that news, how much of it was true? Think of how many Republicans were simply run over. And this is why so many Republicans now reflexively with things like Charlottesville accept the narrative and begin parroting the narrative because they've grown up over decades, especially these senators. Remember, senators are sort of our oldest politicians. They're the ones that have been in the system for the longest, which means a lot of them started their political lives back in the 70s. And a lot of what you do as a politician is sort of formed in your first few years, your reality of how you got elected, what it took to get elected, and then you, you just sort of hone that throughout your career. So it's important to know when you're dealing with politicians, what decade do they come from and when was their reality formed? And most of our senators come from the 70s or the 80s, in which it was a free fire zone for the left. And they learned very early on to never fight the narratives because that was impossible. You would get destroyed if you fought the narratives. Your job on day one is to say, yeah, that's true, and I'm on the bandwagon as well. That's how they learned politics. So when you see, I know it's frustrating, and you see these Republican senators seem to be the worst when it comes to rejecting the narratives. They seem to be the ones that are the quickest to grab onto whatever the left is pushing and say, me too, I agree, yes, Nazis, the world's full of Nazis, and we have to push back, and praise Antifa. Why do they do that? Because their political history is back when it didn't pay. You could not survive as a Republican by pushing back against the narrative. It's possible to do that and survive now. Trump could not have been the candidate that he is 20 years ago. He could not have survived without there being this bunch of mechanisms out there that could back him up. Those didn't exist 20 years ago. So not that I have any sympathy for these folks because they need to adjust the reality. And if they're just going to continue to act like it's the 1970s where they have to parrot the left's narrative, then they need to be defeated and pushed out and replaced with people that understand that the landscape has changed and they don't have to be surrender monkeys all the time. But it does help you understand their actions. These new Republicans that come into the House whose political careers maybe only go back 10 years or so, notice that they are very different. They tend to push back because they've been able to successfully do that, and they learned very early on in their career that you could push back and win. People like Orrin Hatch and McCain and others that go back to the 70s, they think that's a lost cause. And they can't break. They're, they're like the elephant in the circus. You know, when they first get the elephant, they chain him down with a spike and the elephant learns that it can't go anywhere. And once the elephant has decided it can't escape, they just replace the little leg chain with a rope, which the elephant could break at any time and run off, but it doesn't because it just thinks, I can't go anywhere. And so many Republicans, and I use this analogy specifically because it's about an elephant. Yes, I see the irony. So many older Republicans in politics are like those elephants. They, when they were young, it was a chain next to their ankle. And even though it's only a rope now and they could break free and they could reject the narrative, they don't because their spirits were broken a long time ago. Interesting. You know, Matt, I know you're a great reader of history and you're able to see so many parallels in today's world. So my question to you is what 10 books would you recommend to help educate people? <laughs> 
So I do get this question a fair amount because people know I read and they want recommendations. And I could recommend a lot of different books and it would be very easy to recommend sort of basic things like Atlas Shrugged or a Thomas Sowell book or The Road to Serfdom, things like that. But I have over time decided that the the best recommendation I can make is to focus people on the real history over the last 150 years of what's really been going on with the communist manifesto that was written by Karl Marx, which I do not recommend anybody read, much like the Dianetics, the, the Scientology book. I don't think that 80% of the people who claim they've read these books have actually read them. They're totally inaccessible books. They read like they're in a foreign language, and they're just tombs. They, they're better as doorstops. So I would never recommend a book that I didn't think was very readable. And so even if somebody originates a concept in their book, if they don't really do a good job of communicating that, and then 10 or 20 years later, someone else comes along and writes basically the same book, describing the same things, but their book is much more accessible, much easier to read, I'll always recommend that book. Because I think it's important to enjoy yourself when you're reading. The best books are the books that can impart wisdom to you, but do it in an entertaining way that are page turners. You just don't want to put them down. So A, I would never recommend a book that I just thought was dry. But second, as I was saying, I just think that the more important thing for people to do is to understand what's been going on for the last 150 years with this communist and then the international socialist movement that began in the late 1800s, which heavily affected and took over the progressive movement all of this stuff that's been pushed on us, I think understanding that history, it makes all of the other stuff much more interesting. And I think you can jump off from there to a lot of other books. And also, I would say as a caveat that there are a lot of figures on the right who just write a book or two because that's part of how they make money. And I don't generally recommend those books. I've read them and some of them are okay. And but they're 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 just not that interesting, and I I don't I wouldn't generally recommend them. So of course, any first of all, anything by Ann Coulter because she's very readable, she's very funny. Ann Coulter is much better in her books and in her columns, in her writing than she is in her interviews. She's not the best public speaker when it comes to interviews. It can be a little bit shrill, a little bit hard edged, and the humor doesn't come through at all. She's already confessed that she's given up on trying humor in public interviews because stuff gets edited and used against her. But I always recommend Ann Coulter in her original form, which is her books. Read her books. They're all eminently readable. They're at times hysterically funny because her wit is just sharp and she's very, very funny. And she is ruthless with the left in her books. And everything is footnoted. So they try to attack her every you know with every book that comes out they find a couple of periods and commas that are in the wrong place and they really can never land a good punch on her so with that all being said i i would recommend a series of books that outline the history of the left because i think it opens your eyes to so much of what's going on and and so in some semblance of order i would start with a book by joshua moravchik called heaven on earth he comes from a leftist family, and the book is essentially a history of communi communal attempts, both in England and the United States, where people got together and formed what were essentially socialist communities or communist communities where they were going to share alike. And each one, and this goes back to the early 1800s, they're all disasters. They don't work out. And he ties that book right into all of those policies eventually becoming government policies in the 20th century. And I, I recommend that book as a start because it gives you a sense of sort of the early socialist impulses in folks in the 19th century. And even though it was all failing, how it was just continuing to perpetuate itself because it became this religious fervor to believe that, as his book title suggests, they could create this heaven on earth if they just kept trying. Secondly, I would recommend Treason by Ann Coulter. My favorite book of hers is Treason, which goes over the history of communist infiltration in the United States and will revise your understanding of McCarthy and the HUAC committees and everything that was going on at the in the middle of the last century. Jonah Goldberg wrote a book called Liberal Fascism. There are a couple of people on this list who are never Trumpers. And while I would not 
recommend any of their columns today, and I think they're on their way out. They still contributed some things in their past to the canon, which are helpful. And in this case, Jonah Goldberg's liberal fascism is a great history lesson on fascism and what it was. It's an article of the left, and you cannot read Jonah's book and not come to an understanding that that's where fascism exists. And anytime then you hear somebody suggest that there are right-wing fascists, that there's a bunch of people on the right who are a bunch of fascists, you should just laugh it off because it has absolutely no historical precedence in the United States. After that, I would recommend Witness by Whitaker Chambers, who was in, this is one of the greatest books of the 20th century, but it's very readable. It's his autobiography of being a Soviet agent in the United States, and he knew Alger Hiss, and he has a famous role in, in history where Alger Hiss was accused, he's a member of the State Department, accused of being a, a, a communist spy. He denied it. The left and the elites came to his defense. Whitaker Chambers, who at the time worked for Time Magazine, comes forward and says, I was his handler. I know this is true. Whitaker Chambers is sort of this fat, dumpy, looking guy and Alger Hiss is debonair and well-dressed and so all the elites basically make this argument of look at this guy how could he possibly be telling the truth well Whitaker Chambers had actually kept the microfiche in a pumpkin in a hollowed out pumpkin in the in the, on one of his farms and he led the FBI to that and very quickly Alger, Alger Hiss has proven to be a liar and actually is convicted of perjury because he had testified and he does time and the left maintains that Alger Hiss was innocent until the Vernona papers come out in the early 90s in which it's now clear that everything that Whitaker Chambers said was true but he writes this book um about his journey. Eventually he ended up on National Review. He worked for William Buckley and I think he committed suicide in the 60s. He was always dealing with depression. But the book is a fascinating read and it's a window into what was really going on subversively in the country throughout the 20th century. I would follow that up with Radical Son, another insider account. This is Radical Son is by David Horowitz, who was a red diaper baby, came from parents who were avowed communists, and was a 60s radical, prominent 60s radical, who made the journey in the 70s away from all of that. By the end of the 70s, he was essentially a Reagan supporter. And he wrote this autobiography, Radical Son, I believe in the 80s, late 80s, and it's a fascinating read about his interaction with the Black Panthers in the 70s. And eventually what happens is they murder somebody, somebody he had recommended to them as an employee, and they end up killing her. And he has to, that's, you know, they all, they all, there's that old saying about conservative is a liberal who was mugged by reality. And David methodically walks through how he, his conscience came after him, and he was not able to reconcile what he knew to be true about the Black Panthers and what he believed on the left. And his journey begins. And he outlines that all in detail. It's a very well-written, fascinating book. And again, pulls the veil back on the 60s and what was going on in the 60s. Then I'd recommend a book called Red Star Over Hollywood. It was written by R Ronald and Alice Rodosh. They go into great detail about Soviet penetration into the... Screenwriters Guild, and what was actually going on in the 30s and 40s in Hollywood and why HUAC came after them. He, lay, he and his wife lay out the evidence, and once you understand what it was really like to be in that community, and, and they used to have these vicious star chambers where they would bring a screenwriter to, one of, to someone's house, and that person would be berated because they'd written some script that was too pro-capitalist. And this person would then have to self-flagellate, you know, and and drop to their knees and essentially beg for forgiveness to maintain their membership in the group. This was hardcore stuff, and most Americans don't know what was really going on. But once you've read Red Star Over Hollywood, everything that HUAC was doing to try to get communist influence out of Hollywood makes a lot more sense. Then I would recommend a book called Rules for Corporate Warriors. This is a little little difficult to find. It's not currently uh, in print, but you can find used versions out there on Amazon. Rules for Corporate Warriors by Nick Nichols. He is a PR executive who wrote a book, this book, essentially as a response to the Alinsky's Rules for Radicals about how companies 
can push back against the shakedown schemes that come against them. But I find the book fascinating because it's broken into two parts. The first half is just a history lesson on the environmental movement, and it's filled with quote, damning quotes from prominent people in the environmental movement saying vicious anti-human things. And while you, by the time you're done with the first half of the book, you have a very clear-eyed understanding of who the environmental movement is and what their objectives are. And then in the second half of the book, he goes on to use through some examples of clients he actually worked with how you can push back against some of these takedown schemes that come from the environmental community. And he explains how they make a tremendous amount of money doing what they're doing. It's an eye-opening book. Then I would recommend a book by another person who's pretty well a never-Trumper at this point. The it, His name is Stephen F. Hayward. He wrote this very long book, and I'm putting this eighth or ninth on the list because I recommend it only once you've read the other books. And you ha if you're still interested and you want to continue on this list, I would then recommend The Age of Reagan by Stephen Hayward. It's a long book. I think it's over a 1,000 pages. It essentially is the history of Ronald Reagan from the time he left the governorship in the late 60s till he was elected president in 1980. So it's about this 12-year period. But it's half a history of Reagan in this time and half a history of the government, what was going on as the left got stronger and stronger, culminating, I believe, in 74 with them, the, these hard leftists taking over the, the Congress and then Carter coming in. There was this 12-year period when the Goldwaterites were taking over the Republican Party and not quite at a point where they could ascend to power. And the left was running wild within the federal government. And in detail, through the welfare programs and the environmental programs and the rest, Stephen outlines through anecdotes and stories just the kind of horrible things that were going on that explained why Reagan was elected, why the population seemed so frustrated by 1980 and was ready to elect Ronald Reagan. And maybe some people would think the book was dry. I didn't because he gave so many details and stories about what was happening. I thought it was fascinating to have it, the whole bureaucracy explained in the way that Stephen did. So even though it was well over a thousand pages, I thought it was a page turner. I, I was constantly interested in learning more about this stupid, inane, and in many cases, evil things that were being done on a constant basis in the name of the federal government. Lastly, I would recommend a book called Hoodwinked by Jack Cashel. Jack wrote a wonderful book that talks about a lot of the narratives from the 20th century that are just simply not true. So he has different chapters dedicated to different myths about the 20th century. I was shocked. Most of the things that he talked about in the book were things that I had just taken for granted. And he eviscerates Margaret Mead. Margaret Reed is famous anthropologist who apparently went to this Micronesian island and wrote this seminal book. Well, he proves that she never even went there. And Alex Haley writes Roots, and he points out that most of Roots was plagiarized by, from another guy. It, 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 a lot of it is not actually Alex Haley's story personal story and he took it he was sued jack goes into the detail about the fact that he was sued by the guy who wrote this other book and ultimately settled with him so one by one he demolishes these narratives from the 20th century that are in the history books that people believe are true that are simply not true and it's a that one's a total page turner and i i definitely recommend it if you like that book i would also recommend a book that jack cashel wrote called what's the matter with california a gentleman by the name of thomas frank wrote this book what's the matter with kansas which i never read because i didn't need to because it was such a left sensation that there were hundreds of articles about the book and so you could read one of these articles and get the gist of what the book was about so i get it he was essentially uh, making this argument of why why are all these red state voters being hoaxed by social concerns like abortion when economically they're not very wealthy and they should be voting with Democrats on economic issues. And that was the, the thesis of this What's the Matter with Kansas. Well, Jack responded by writing this book called What's the Matter with California, in which he talks about it really isn't the counter argument. He's not trying to make the argument that California should be voting Republican or anything. What he does in the book is talk about how California descended into an amoral chaos starting in the 50s and 60s. 
and that that cancer spread all over the United States, how California was the place of a lot of firsts. And he goes back through a lot of stories which we know, but he pieces them all together from the Manson murders to a whole bunch of other crimes to talk about the kind of debauchery and evil that was going on. And he strings them in, in, in a pattern that lets you see this sort of slow decline of California and how they're all connected, rather than as sort of these isolated sensational stories that, that we are used to thinking of them as. It's a fascinating read, and, and um, that's an 11th book, so I'm not really recommending it as my 10, but I'm just suggesting that if you like Jack Cashel's book, Hoodwinked, that would be the next one I would recommend. If you want to ask me a question, I want to make sure you have my email. I, I, I know that we post the podcast and some of you feel like you don't have a way of communicating directly with me. So I'm going to give you my email address. It's mattmwingard at gmail.com. And I'm going to spell that out. M-A-T-T-M-W-I-N-G-A-R-D at gmail.com. So if there's something you'd like me to talk about on the podcast or a question you want answered be happy to do that. Shoot me a, an email and let me know. I want to make another point about how immigration has changed the country. So I'm interested in genealogy stuff, and it led me to a fascinating question about immigration and how immigration changes the country. Doris and I have talked about this before. With all of the monuments being attacked, Christopher Columbus and, and Thomas Jefferson and the Confederate monu monuments and the rest, I've been trying to make this point that there are a whole bunch of people in this country who do not trace any ancestors back to that history. Some of us who do, we think of the United States as that begins in 1776 or even earlier with the Plymouth Rock and, and the Pilgrims coming over. But I, I, my argument would be, if you don't have a physical connection to that through an ancestor, that really doesn't seem like your history. If your ancestors came here in 1910 and became citizens then, and you were born here, and or you're the grandson of the great-grandson, you're not that connected. Now, if you've married in to other Americans, and therefore you know, your mother or your father is somehow connected to that, you still feel connected to it. But there are a growing number of people who have no ancestors that they can trace back in American history beyond, say, 1910 or 1890. Now we have a whole bunch of people who don't have any American ancestry, and I'm talking about American citizen ancestry, that goes back before 1960. So this matters, and it changes a country. And I'm going to start by making the point that I got curious about this myself because I have a one of my grandparents is Canadian, came from Canada, became a U.S. citizen. So obviously through her line, I go immediately back to Canada and then France and places in Europe. So there's no American connection there. They came over to Canada in about 1905. But the other three uh, grandparents do have an American history that stretches back, in some cases, all the way back to the early 1700s. They have some Swiss Mennonites that came over in the early um, 1700s and settled in Pennsylvania, and then I have ancestors, I, I can trace myself back to the Mayflower, which is not unusual, millions of people can do that. But I worked out the percentage, and it works out to about 62% of my ancestry goes back through all of American history, and therefore 38% of my ancestry does not. It doesn't go back further than essentially the 1940s when my grandmother came down from Canada. And I obviously am very interested in American history. I feel connected to it. I'm a conservative. I define myself through all of that, that history. But what happens when somebody's percentage drops to 40% or 20% or 0%? Right. And again, rather than zero, I mean, let's talk about what year does American history really begin for them based on they and their family. And as I said, for some people, that can be 1960. And for a lot of people, it can be somewhere between 1890 and 1910. So it's no coincidence that it's not historical monuments from the 20th century that you're seeing being attacked or that people are not that concerned about being taken down. It's monuments from before that that a lot of people don't personally feel connected to. And I would make the argument that this matters, that as we have allowed a lot of immigration, immigration has changed the country. Not just the recent immigration, but 
the immigration that part of my family was a part of that happened a hundred years ago. That was not the same folks. They weren't coming from the same place, ethnically, religiously different. And then we have ethnically and, and religiously different folks or a religious folks coming in since the 1960s. And it matters. It changes how people interpret and and value American history. So I just I'm I'm just starting to get you to think about this idea that to the extent to which American history is important, say something that happened in 1850, people have to feel personally connected to that. And I can trace ancestors that were around in 1850 in the United States. So of course that's much more real for me. If my neighbor has ancestry that only goes back to 1910 in the United States, and then their ancestry is outside of the United States beyond that, then 1850 United States just doesn't matter to them. They don't care about that. They have no personal connection to it whatsoever. So as we have had the immigration that we've had and has that has changed the makeup of the country, I think it has a direct influence on why so much of this history, American history that's further back, is either disparaged or ignored or just considered inconsequential by a growing number of American citizens. Something to think about. Doris and I went to see Ingrid Goes West. It's kind of an indie film. There wasn't a lot to choose from, so we chose this one. It's basically the story of a very mentally unhealthy young woman who's completely addicted to her social media accounts. She is has no sense of her own self and she latches on to people who are very successful in social media and she wants the life that they're pretending to have and that's sort of what's revealed as she latches on to one of these social media stars it becomes clear that the social media star has completely invented this life for herself she's just much more successful at it than Ingrid so there's a lot of cross currents about criticisms and commentary on social media and mental health and narcissism in the movie and it's definitely a dark comedy it has some laughs not a lot but a few laughs it's amusing in general i would give the whole thing overall a b because i just thought it had some third act problems i thought it raised a lot of interesting questions i had no idea where it was going and it was entertaining to a point but then once we got into the third act some things started happening that were very predictable and I just thought it kind of sold itself out towards the end. But it has some interesting things to say about the current culture, and that's why I would give it a B. Doris, your thoughts? Well, first of all, I found it both interesting and repulsive. Yes, I would agree with that. So the actress Aubrey Plaza is wholly believable as an unhinged social media stalker. She uses Instagram to stalk her prey in this satire about social media. And while social media allows lonely, bored, and envious people to find listeners, we are reminded that it doesn't take the place of normal human contact. True. So if you are finding yourself falling asleep with your cell phone in your hand, perhaps you should reassess your life. Yeah. I was, Doris and I were talking about this after the movie. Uh, the, the only social media work I do is is this political stuff designed to communicate a message and to try to foster a sense of community among Trump supporters. I do zero social media work for personal reasons. I don't. I have a Facebook page that I never visit. I detest Facebook, and I'm not posting pictures of myself or my food or what I'm wearing or where I'm going. Very very seldom do any of that because I spent some time traveling for a couple years out of the country and I didn't have a smartphone during that time period and it was quite a eye-opening experience. I enjoyed myself a lot more when I wasn't thinking through everything through that social media lens. So I just made a decision when I came back to the United States I just wasn't going to do that anymore. But like I said, I end up doing a lot of it but for basically business reasons or political reasons. But this movie was about somebody whose social life is totally wrapped up. Their, their sense of self and their existence is wrapped up in what's going on in their social media interactions. And uh, it's supremely unhealthy. It was fascinating, though. Fascinating.
All right, well, we're just about out of time. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Pocket Cast. This is a labor of love, but we need to grow, so I would really appreciate it if you would recommend this podcast to one other person. And remember, you are not alone. Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye, Matt.